Welcome to Editorial Wisecracks, Lash LaRue, and I'm Janice Messer, and tonight our guest is Abby Hoffman. And Abby, before we start the talk, I personally would like to extend you a thanks from someone, from myself, who was 15 years old in 1968, and who was wondering... 15 in 1968. 15 years old in 1968, <laughs> and I was wondering, what are those people doing? And I thought about it, and I figured it out. And I'd like yeah. to thank you. <laughs> no. <laughs> For doing what he did in 68. Yeah, right. 68 and I think and a lot of us feel that way. Uh, so uh, that's my personal thanks. And I assume cheer. that I speak for other people also. And did I? Yeah, yeah, well, you know, compliments are almost as tough to deal with as insults in a certain <laughs> kind of way for me. That's true. I don't true, know how yeah. to Because uh, I'm not this. sure if I'm doing or it's doing for me. Right. If I'm doing for it, or it's, I mean, I don't, I don't, my conceptualization of, uh, of struggle and social change does not have to involve sacrifice. No, but... In fact, but you're gaining as much as you're giving, so... Yes, exactly. Yeah. Why, why do it if you're not getting something out of it? Yeah. Exactly. So you gave a rousing speech last night. At least it roused, seemed to rise, rouse, rouse the audience. Pretty, yeah. And, uh... Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, I, I don't really know very much about you, and I suspect some of our viewers don't either. <clears throat> this is kind of a low-level question, perhaps. But where did you grow up? What, uh, you know, I'm curious about that, because some people say of me, when they're trying to figure out why I behave the way they do, uh -huh. and they find out that I, they find out right. I came well, from... Well, actually, I, I have an autobiography called Soon to be a Major Motion Picture. In fact, I have, I have seven autobiographies. I, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I uh, do involve myself, uh, in a sense, as a character in my own play and as a vehicle, uh, because I, I believe that the form of communication uh, in the U.S. is the soap opera. So you have to, people yeah. want to say, yeah, we heard all that before, but where are you from? <laughs> you know, they always want to know where you're from. Yeah. Where are you coming from? Coming from, yeah. <laughs> so I'm coming from Worcester, Massachusetts. Is that uh, right? Yeah, where I um, actually um, began my activist career. My mother would say when I was four. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, but, uh, you know, starting to fight the schoolyard bullies. Uh, putting up a good scrap, uh, but I would say back in about 1960, when I returned after college and uh, then got involved with the Ban the Bomb movement and was uh, community organizing now, the local ghettos. Speaking of college, are you a Berkeley, California product? I went Brandeis undergraduate oh. at a point in the late 50s after Joe McCarthy had swept through Boston on mm -hmm. his witch hunt crusade. The only school he failed to touch was Brandeis because he didn't want to be called anti-Semitic. So, of course, all the best professors <laughs> flocked there. So yeah. I studied with people like Herbert Marcuse, uh, mm -hmm. Frank Manuel, uh, Irving Howe, uh, Max Lerner. I had uh, Abraham Maslow, probably the greatest psychologist in history. God, what a break. In U.S. history. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, it was a real... Uh, was it, well, I knew right off because the school I, high school I was going to, I'd actually gone to private school because I got kicked out of high school. And uh, uh, the... They wanted me to go to Brown or some other Ivy League school, but um, they were so dead set against the school because it was only seven years old and everything that I uh, fell in love with it right away. Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, one of the neighborhood guru, uh, this guy Herbie, uh, who I admired a lot, he had gone off there and come back and talked about people like Freud and Albert Camus and... That was all new, uh, you know, the closest I'd got to Western civilization was classic comics at that point. I mean, we really weren't taught much in Worcester in the high school, and was, you know, so it sounded really interesting. So Brandeis, and then I went to Berkeley for graduate school. Oh, uh -huh. So the combination of Brandeis and Berkeley uh, in the late 50s, and then, Ber uh, you know, graduate school at Berkeley, it, 60s had just about did it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> then I, uh, I was a clinical psychologist for three years. I never oh. said that in the 60s because they, they'd say I was using hypnosis. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> I kept that quiet. <clears throat> and uh, I guess then I, uh, you know, I became a community organizer, which I've been for uh, about 22 years and have organized on, on many, many different levels and as people now know, under, under different names. Mm -hmm. uh, the press doesn't call me a community organizer. Um, 
that's a term that's not uh, acceptable. That's not a job in the press. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I see me. I, I know it's going to have 20 mistakes when it starts with the word former. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, they're missing the point already. You yeah. Know? yeah. So. Uh, uh, it's harder to read about me. It's very hard to read about me in the newspapers because um, I'm attacking uh, the interests that control the media. Yeah. So it's yeah. it's it's uh, it's extremely hard to read about me. It's much easier, you know. They see me live. They hear me talk, and they say, "Oh, yeah, that's him." I, you know, yeah. and. Uh, there's less room for things to get or, uh, screwed up if if they actually see you. Yeah, and hear for you. me, at the printed media. You know, if they're losing $20 million a year each newspaper, I could care less. Yeah. It's all got, you know, it's a, it's fish wrapper for me. So uh, wrap your, it all uh, up and put it away because they're extremely inaccurate. It would be no problem for me to pick up the newspapers that covered the speech last night and find anywhere between three and 15 factual errors and misquotes. No problem at you all. You think that's deliberate on their part? Or well, part of it is, of course, is, is sloppy journalism. Uh, but part is uh, a set point of view. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and a set point of view to, uh, that's there to please the publisher. And uh, what they hope is uh, to please this readership that they have out there. You right. know, that's yeah. imagined. So they start with a set point of view. Yeah, so, they look uh, at it through their it's own. It's not all haphazard. There is there is something going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know they do have a. In your there. community organizing days, did you ever have any contact with Saul Alinsky? I think of him as a. Community Saul was my, uh, he 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 was my guru, uh, mm -hmm. of course, because there was no one. Uh, for the most part, the '60s was made by activists like myself who made it up as we went along. Uh, uh, we had no ideology, because it's a European invention. I don't believe there's an American word for ideology, even. And if you say it, people go like, oh, you know. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> there, we, we, we just responded, in, in a sense, out of our own moral outrage mm -hmm. about discovering there were other uh, rules whereby the power structure played the game than what we were taught, and that there was another America that we weren't learning about. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't blame kids today for not understanding too much about what went on in the 60s, because when I went to school, as a smart kid, I didn't know about the Scottsboro Boys, uh, the Rosenbergs. I didn't know about uh, the witch hunts. I didn't know about the Depression. I didn't know about the labor struggles in the 30s, the genocide of the Indians, the lynchings. I didn't know that whole history at all. I was taught the history of the establishment. So I can't blame people, you know, yeah. if they are cut off from the history. So we were fortunate, to, those of us that paid attention, to notice Saul Alinsky, and uh, he was, a, he was in, in my opinion, an incredibly good organizer and extremely pragmatic. Mm -hmm. um, we had a few uh, arguments at the end, unfortunately, um, you know, and I, and I think his tech, I think some of his tech, we're all children of our time, yeah. and I think that... Uh, his victories can be improved upon, and uh, I think that mine can be improved upon. Uh, you know, but I, I hope someday to write a hand, uh, an organizing handbook. You know, some like did, did on he, saving rivers, junkies, and other living things. Yeah. Of you but he the used list. a lot of entertainment, actually, too. He used yeah. a lot of guerrilla theater, what you would call yippee tactics, in terms mm -hmm. of his organizing in Rochester and and uh, the back of the ads in Chicago. And you know, we saw eye to eye. Now, when you mentioned Yippies, is that organization, if we can call it an organization, does that still exist? Uh, there are there are groups all over the country, and they do have national newspaper, and they oh. they do uh, rel relate to me as kind of like Papa Yippie. Yeah, it's it's strange. <laughs> I, I was spoke at the University of Michigan. It was funny at the end because a student. Came up to me and he said, "I'm I'm proud to meet you. My father was a yippie." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, as, a, as a professor, I can uh, I can appreciate yeah. that. I'm getting the children of my former students now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Grandpa yippie. Yeah. No, uh, and that raises a problem. Uh, as a professor, I have a problem <clears throat> relating to the the new waves of students as they come along. You know, back in the '60s, I felt there was a lot of idealism mm -hmm. among the students. 
And then in the 70s, that didn't seem to be there, and lots of people wring their hands, you know, the people I associate with faculty members, they wring their hands over what they view as a total absence of any idealism among this generation of students. Mm. My feeling is the idealism is there, it's always there in young people. What, what seems to be needed is some issue they can coalesce around or will crystallize mm -hmm. their uh, feelings. Yeah. And I think that idealism will surface again. Absolutely as right. I think the, uh, I, I mean, I guess I'm sort of like you. I tend not to trust anyone under 30 at this point, and they are a little <laughs> wet behind the ears. But I don't, I don't speak down in a certain sense because I, I think back to my own education and how yeah. many gaps were missing. and. Uh, uh, you know, how did we get trapped into uh, the hippie versus hard hat kind of a thing? Well, mm -hmm. we didn't know about the labor movements and the th we didn't understand. We didn't yeah. know where, what doors to knock on. Yeah. Uh, so, so I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I think, you know, maybe there was a little more idealism in the in, in the sixties. I'm kind of ready to think that the idealism stays constant. You're going to have a certain number of people that are going to operate idealistically. What changed between the 60s and the 80s is economic situation, yeah. demographics, mm -hmm. so you had much more youth then. Uh, the, the, the technological gap, namely that the, uh, the generals in the Pentagon and the uh, captains of industry and people down in Washington, they were uh, fighting a war uh, through, through linear medium. Uh, we had grown up on television, so it was very easy for us to understand instinctively how to use television. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the next wave of technological inventions, namely uh, uh, computers, was much more understood by the right. They understand the use of computers, say direct mailings and all that, and yeah. how you keep track of everybody and communicate through computers much better than, let's say, the left. So, so I, I think uh, technology, economics, demographics, um, uh, all, all this is also, I think there's always a tendency among the tastemakers at the center uh, to put things in terms of decades mm -hmm. because it's easy or that way to sell things. It's easier to get people to change their clothes, to change their thinking about what kind of music they're going to like and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. I, I don't... Um, I don't have in my con my mind that uh, things belong in terms of decades. Mm -hmm. uh, apathy, I assume apathy was there for 300,000 years and <laughs> yeah. was, has been the dominating force. <laughs> I right. think most people <laughs> just want to uh, lie out in the sun and uh, go fishing and mow the lawn and uh, take it easy and uh, uh, do not want to connect themselves. Uh, to major issues that are going to uh, shake the boat, rattle the trees, mm -hmm. and, and change society. And uh, yeah. that the people who are in control of society are always going to keep the lid on. I mean, uh, to think that Karl Marx came up with the idea, for example, that uh, the bosses, when they have the capital and the power, that the only uh, that the only power that the workers can have is to all organize and get together. To think there was an original idea with him is a misreading of history. I'm sure there was somebody in the cave periods who came up with that idea. Yeah. Karl Marx just had a good press agent. You know, so so uh, uh, I think the ideas have always been there, and I think yeah. idealism has always been there. If you're searching for the burning issue in the 80s, it's going to be uh, the nuclear arms race, I think. I, I'm pretty sure that that's going to be the hot issue that everyone is going, the young people are going to see is going to uh, screw up their career plans, just as in the 60s it was Vietnam. Don't yeah. forget, there was a lot of self-interest going on in the 60s. Oh, yeah. There yeah. was yeah. blacks in the civil rights movement because they felt this was the vehicle whereby they personally could achieve more participation, yeah. more jobs. More jobs. Uh, right. Same with the women's movement. There is self-interest involved. Um, well, uh, no, Vietnam, they didn't, they didn't want to go off and fight in a war and get killed. A perfectly legitimate. Mm -hmm. I mean, I tend to downplay idealism yes. and tend to try to connect, if you listen to the talk carefully, try to connect their self-interest yeah. to the global issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I, I, you know, I'm... I'm yeah, uh, that's very, I good leave point. The, very yeah. effective. Yeah. yeah, that's an excellent point. Yeah, it's, to me, like you were saying, that people want to lay around and sunbathe and just do their own thing and the only time I think that they will get involved is if they see a threat 
to their self-interest. Well, I think there's another. I think there's self. a. Uh, I have just. I, I would. I would. Uh, I would add to that a little. Right. Um, um, I studied with Abraham Maslow, who was a self-actualizing mm -hmm. theorist, uh, the father of the human potential movement right. that's cashing in now, you know, with a lot of phony books and <laughs> phony seminars, vis-a-vis -vis Werner Erhardt and all those other uh, slick oil salesmen. But uh, Maslow really had a key on things, and I think he re rejected the Freudian notion that we do things out of deficiency, you right. know, uh, because we can't do this, we do this. He came up with the idea of that these potentials uh, for creativity, for altruism, are inside us bursting to get out and are part and parcel of our makeup. So as a clinical psychologist, I'm really interested in, the psych in revolutionary psychology. That is, my theory is that what people, what when you have a society uh, geared to the notion that the individual, that the I, is the most important pronoun, that you look out for I, number one, uh, the glorification of the I, the rugged individualist, in the sense that, as say, Ayn Rand or someone else put it mm -hmm. forth, the, the Western frontier concept, mm -hmm. you have the problem, you have built into that anti-community. Uh, therefore, eventually, you're going to end up pretty lonely. A lot of lonely, lonely people wandering around this country. And, and the, the problem of psychological loneliness is one that can be addressed by asking people, you know, by showing people the opportunity of participating in a community. And uh, if you're lucky enough, that community becomes the whole planet. So uh, there is the self-interest of your own psychological health in terms of connecting yourself to the, to so, to the whole community. Yeah, because yeah. a person can't, I don't believe, can't be healthy as a, as a single unit. Yeah. They have to have the network, the social network. I think the thing that differentiates <coughs> my technique of organizing, or at least I try to all the time, that's why I, I use humor a lot, uh, and differentiates it from, let's say, uh, the church, or uh, the church known as the, uh, as the left much of the left, mm -hmm. which is in itself a, a sectarian church in my opinion, is that I, I try not to play on guilt feelings. Right. I, try to, 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 I try to appeal to the sense of liberation, of yes. breaking away from the old moles, that this is going to be a liberating experience that is going to stick with you, you know, for a long part of your life and is going to make you a more holistic, more healthy, uh, more energetic, uh, happier human being. Uh, I am using that Maslow, uh, Maslowian approach right. uh, in all my organizing work, and I try not to use guilt. It didn't work with me. When my mother said, finish your, di finish your dinner because there's a million people starving in yeah. China, I said, name one. <laughs> or, or send them <laughs> you know, this but food. But she started laugh. She laughed right off and got the point. She never tried to guilt trip me anymore. Yeah, that's kind of a uh, right. generational thing, too. In my youth, the saying was, there are a lot of starving Armenians who uh, eat yeah. that food. Yeah. Oh, you're, oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> Uh, right. Because no, that goes be way Chinese. back, Abby. Because no, the Chinese no, have the, taken care yeah. of their well, problems. What you're saying about your organizing technique is uh, extremely interesting. I hadn't really thought that through, I have to admit. Oh. Now, how would you relate that, or could you use that technique if you're trying to organize workers? The GM is confronted with an organizing drive among its white-collar workers right now, and they're, they're loaded with this individualism and this I am the only thing that's important. Well, the organized workers, uh, the first, first step in organizing, and I hope, uh, like Alinsky, uh, maybe three, five years down the road, uh, to set up a school for organizing uh, where I live in the Thousand Islands in upstate New York and let them observe, save the River Committee mm -hmm. uh, that we've started and has been so effective and is very broad-based in terms of including all kinds of of, of, uh, of Americans to let them understand the history of this and to teach the science of organizing, which I believe is a science. I can't teach it in a speech like last night to 2,000 people because I've got to be so much involved in like addressing where everybody is in the audience, so yeah, you don't have yeah. time for the nitty gritty. Mm -hmm. But the first step in organizing is, to, of course, to meet the people. Uh, that is a really complicated step. So, you know, um, uh, you don't necessarily, you, 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 if you ask you about the labor workers, I'd have to be invited. You'd have to be invited in, actually. 
to, to a new uh, kind of movement. I would have had to have been invited into the area in which I operate under Barry Freed. They would have, hey, Abby Hoffman, you know, like, wait a second now, we're 75% for Reagan, we're conservatives <laughs> up here. I mean, he's the devil's son. What are we getting into in a bed with here? But they, you know, they saw me work for three and a half years under another name. They, they, uh, they know where my heart and mind are. It's in the Saving the River. They right. know you can win. You so were you, one of them. You had By that time, that. I had gone. I'd gone probably in that area the quickest from being uh, an outsider to an insider, because mm -hmm. uh, right. you got to have two sets of grandparents buried in a local cemetery up yeah. there to, even, <laughs> you know, by the time right. you're called a native. Yeah. So now, I mean, they cl they claim me. Uh, <clears throat> partly as a tourist attraction, <laughs> there, you know, hell of a lot happening to find you these days since right. the glacier went through town. But yeah. you know, partly because they know uh, that I'm saving the river, and the river is connected to the local economies. This is not an environmental movement, mm -hmm. so it would be no problem for me to talk uh, to uh, steel workers, especially uh, or auto workers, especially unemployed auto workers. Uh, you know, together I think we could come up with some kind of strategy. Uh, I hate to lay it all out because it, it is, it's not something that I've formulated in my head because that's not fair yeah. and that yeah. doesn't work because I would go in with a preconceived notion of where they are at. I, mm -hmm. To meet people, you have to find out where their mm -hmm. needs are mm -hmm. and then connect them to the strategy and the ideas that you have. You can't put the horse, you can't put the cart before the horse. You can't come in with a preset need and say, like, look, I, solved the, I am the expert. Yeah. I mean, in fine view, we have a definition of an expert. The expert is somebody from out of town. Yeah. So, of course, you have to show first that you are from in town, that you're an amateur just like everybody else. You're just going to roll up your sleeves. But you've had some victories. Mm -hmm. Americans like winners. Yeah. They, they, yeah. they want to know, have you scored some victories? That's not what you're going to get reading the press. You read the press about me, you're going to say, well, this guy's famous, and you know he's a troublemaker. And, mm -hmm. and you know once in a while, he says something funny, and he's offbeat, and he's a, could, rebel of, uh, he's a rebel of sorts. You could even but, get the impression you're a clown reading the papers. Clown. Prince not clown to be taken left, seriously. Yeah. Cause, cause, yeah. 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 yeah, well, the problem is that people don't know that most of the uh, most of the philosophers were stand-up philosophers, the great ones in history. I mean, everybody was a clown. Yeah. I mean, was, you say, uh, you know, every guy wants to screw his mother. I mean, imagine when Freud said that. They must have been rolling in the aisles. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all through history, it's everything that's not, all those people said. I mean, I see them all as uh, as as comedians and yeah. coming from the Hebrew persuasion. Of course, that's just a natural uh, defense and survival <laughs> mechanism. It's no problem right. at all. So, so if you've got it as a technique, why not use it? Uh, what they do, you see, th see, they've the, they've got the opposite of serious as funny. Uh, yeah. That's weird. It's not that way in my dictionary. The opposite of serious is not serious or not. It's what people in Washington are doing and what the heads of General Motors do is very not serious. It's not funny either. You yeah. see, it's people not funny either. Washington are doing, how would you explain the sudden surge of uh, support for the nuclear freeze uh, movement? Well, that's in, uh, I think this is going to connect back to another question. I think there's a media myth that the 60s, I'd, to use decadism language, the idealists of the 60s were disillusioned in the 70s, went greedy in the 80s. Yeah. Um, I don't find that true. What happened was, because the economy changed, especially the economies of the cities, so dramatically um, in the last 10 or 15 years, that in order to hold on to your political beliefs to the extent that you wanted to put in four, five, six hours a day of organizing, in order to do that and to hold a job, which you now had to do, and to raise a family, mm -hmm. as is the natural course of human events, you had to leave the cities. Uh, so the, the 60s people migrated out of the cities into the countryside. In New York, they went to western Massachusetts, they went to Vermont, they went to upstate New York, much as I did. I mean, I, I, I believe that I am a prototype, even though it's exaggerated because uh, I was a fugitive, I'm a prototype of what happened. Uh, to 60s veterans. Mm -hmm. So now they stayed politically active uh, and they pushed their town councils to debate global issues like El Salvador, like n nuclear arms debate. And all through there, as I travel around, I see it's the 60s people who are involved in the environmental movement, who are involved in the nuclear arms freeze. You go to a state like Vermont 10 years ago, it was the most uh, 
conservative. Conservative <laughs> state in the Northeast, out of New Hampshire. I mean, a real rock rib Republican, Aiken, you know, mm -hmm. an old, old fart as you ever want to see in terms of like, uh, you know, sitting on the lid as far as the majority of the people uh, getting a cut of the action. Now you can go and you've got an independent socialist of uh, Mayor Burlington, largest city. Well, yeah. he came from New York City 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you've got uh, all, I mean, I, I get a larger crowd and, a, and uh, I, a more comradely response at the University of Vermont than I do at New York University. Or I do it in any, in any of the major cities. Yeah. The cities are really s screwed up. So. Uh, I think this grassroots movement is, is spreading because I think um, there's a lot of activity occurring in the countryside and it is starting in these small towns and small communities and that's, the, that's probably the great optimism that I feel right now. Uh, the average American, uh, especially the average American worker, uh, sees the connection between uh, the decay of their own community and building a bigger defense uh, machine. Uh, they see that the, uh, we can't go support uh, cutthroats like in El Salvador, uh, Forever Endeavor, and uh, not take money away from programs needed in the inner cities. In other words, they're not, they're not gonna let the power structure chop them up into different camps the way it was in the 60s. Yeah. Uh, they're starting to s search for the most common denominator. And the people are doing this way ahead of the organizations. The polls show incredible resistance to many of Reagan's main policies, but we don't yet have the political organizations or the coalitions that can relate to this. Uh, that's going to be the exciting challenge of the 80s, how we bring people together who are very different, who are very set against each other yeah. in terms of their preconceptions. <clears throat> Let me, let me point uh, one, one thing, because I know you're interested in the labor movement. You remember the hippies versus the hard hats was yeah. a big element of the, of the 60s, not of our own doing. There was nothing, no way in which we could communicate at that level. There was such a grab on the media mm -hmm. and uh, in terms of the people of power. Well, I come from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, spoke at Lehigh University there, and uh, you've got hippie rock groups doing benefits for unemployed steel workers. Mm. And uh, the steel workers, uh, uh, you know, uh, need the food. And they're saying, well, we don't know recession from depression, but like we are hungry and we are out of work. Yeah. So at that point, you know, if, if, um, if that hippie rock group has any soul to it, it's gonna be in there helping out if it has any yeah. conscience. So I, I think we're gonna recognize we're all standing naked in the same barrel in a sense, and there's only mm -hmm. a small percentage that are really gonna be cleaning up on the coming depression. Right, so the former enemies have become our current friends. You're saying with the well, I don't think that they were enemies. I, th I think a lot of the '60s was confrontational, confrontation. not just with the government, but uh, men against women, uh, women against men, uh, blacks against whites, the young against the old. Everybody uh, was an important for uh, dynamic and against each other. And we have to close now. Oh, we this do. is the end of the we're half closing. hour. Okay, well, right. like that wraps so it up. And that wraps it up. See you, and I'd like see you to tomorrow thank you. night. Yes. <laughs> Good night. I'll be right back <laughs> after a word from the weathermen in the right. sports. Sports and weather. Sports and right. weather. Right. New sports and weather. So I like great. that, Ed. <laughs>
of interviewing Abby Hoffman on this program. Today, we're going to do one better. We're going to do Barry Freed today. <laughs> well, we'll see if we can pull this off. This is kind of hard. Now, you probably get asked this all actress. the time, so if it's a dumb mm -hmm. question, I apologize in advance, but how would you explain the inability of the government to find you when you were operating as Barry Freed? Is that well, a tribute to you, or, or is it a condemnation of their ability? Uh, their uh, public statement during those six and a half, seven years was that we're looking very hard. We've contacted Interpol. We have everyone <laughs> alert. And uh, the day after I <laughs> came up, the when Lawrence. they were asked that question, they said, well, we didn't find him because we didn't look. <laughs> but I have 600 pages of the trail, and it went even before I went underground. Technically, they were on my trail looking for me, and uh, right up to about 10 hours before I surfaced. They, in fact, grabbed my car that was being driven down from, uh, from uh, upstate New York down to the city by, by friends. They grabbed them, and they grilled them for uh, two hours to find out where I was. So the, their inability stemmed from a lot of, uh, I mean, there are a lot of reasons why. Number one, I have a network of friends uh, who, who are the kind of friends that you don't buy for money. Mm -hmm. uh, that was very important. Uh, uh, number two, number two, I know how to make friend, new friends. Uh, number three, uh, the uh, plugging myself into the 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 symbol, the image that was Abby Hoffman was part of the media's problem. It was not mine, so of course it served as, as camouflage for yeah. me. As long as I uh, I stayed out of the uh, local uh, uh, hippie joints, you know, as long as I didn't wear my hair down to my shoulders and wear my beads and everything, um, I could, you know, they, uh, they would be looking uh, for another person. Mm -hmm. I, 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 you have to jump class, of course, yeah. you know, uh, when you're a fugitive, uh, you're living on marginal incomes and everything. So I had to under undergo a lot and of course steal this book and the, and the sequel which wasn't published had chapters on how to go underground and of course I had thought about that for a good three or four years ever since the Chicago trial mm -hmm. that this was in, in the cards someday so I had given it a lot of thought so it was a common it, there were other reasons don't forget the FBI in this period <coughs> was on the defensive mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, they were trapped in their own dirty tricks and everything. And uh, to find me, they would have, you know, once you know how to do a uh, cheesebok patch in line to do, I mean, I could call this television studio, talk for two hours, and they could never trace the call. Things like that that I had done. I toured the FBI building on opening day. You know, uh, I, I went to the inaugural, but I was a thorn in their side all the time. They knew I was traveling all over the world and publishing. I published like 40 articles under the name. Abby Hoffman wrote two, two or three books, I guess. So, yeah. so uh, you know, I was, they were always hunting me because I was a headline and they're a public relations firm. <laughs> but uh, I'd always, uh, I operated also on the assumption that they would catch me mm -hmm. every minute. To mm -hmm. do otherwise would have been really foolish. So you're on guard all the time. That uh, on guard constantly. Yes, I remember all, always on guard. And it was quite a strain. I cracked, of course, a couple times underground, which was something I thought I could never do. But keeping all the identities together. <clears throat> yeah, I remember one, I was uh, in a call, I was calling up my mother, you know, uh, and even though it was from a phone booth, you know, uh, with someone else's credit card, I, uh, I dialed halfway through and I hung up. And, cause something clicked in my head and I said, well, if I was the FBI and I was going to pick one day of the year, and go tap one phone 24 hours a day, oh, it would be his mother's phone on Mother's Day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? Reach out and <laughs> touch right. someone. We're all conditioned <laughs> to do that. So I had to get word to Mama that uh, I'd call a week ahead. Yeah. That's the way, you know, so yeah. uh, you had to think every, you had to think what was going on in their mind mm -hmm. constantly because they were. In fact, always there. And last week you were up in Mackinac at a convention about the Great Lakes. Why don't mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about that? <coughs> well, um, as Barry Freed, of course, I uh, ended up in 1970, uh, 1976 on the St. Lawrence River, Thousand Island region, uh, the drain of the Great Lakes, drain pipe of the Great Lakes. Uh, 
I hate to put it that way because uh, it's paradise there. The Indians, that, that was their word for paradise, that area, and it's, it's absolutely gorgeous, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place that I fell in love with uh, over the years. And uh, I had to work at that process because I'm a city boy from a landlocked uh, city and uh, river was just a word in a banjo song. I would know a river from a bathtub, so there it was, you know, and it was my running mate's river. She had grown up there seven generations on the river. The house was right on the river, and after two years of um, just, you know, hanging out and, uh, you know, sneaking off every once in a while to, to, uh, to play Abby and write some article, uh, uh, try and get it published. Uh, along came the Army Corps of Engineers, wanted to rip it all up and destroy it. And uh, it was at that point I had to make uh, the decision about, uh, you know, running, turning her back, or standing and fighting. And of course, I, I decided to stand and fight, uh, you know, given what I said last week in terms of that turning and running uh, makes you feel a little uh, less human inside, you know, turn, it makes you into an alcoholic or you know, something less of a person. So I, I really had no choice in terms of standing and fighting. Also, it had always been my dream to be an inside agitator. You couldn't really call me an outside agitator. They wanted to come right through the fucking living room, if you know what I mean. You know, so like this was about as inside as you can get. And uh, I know the Army Corps engineers uh, were all public relations people. That's really, they're not very few are Army and very few are engineers. They're the kind of people that go into your town and tell you it's going to be real good for you that we destroy your entire town. Yeah. So they got to talk a pretty quick game. So I knew, find you had one hell of a talker living in their midst. Uh, I was convinced I would get caught, of course. There was just no way that I could conceive of a whole strategy of battling them, but uh, we worked it. We got a lot of very, very good allies, and after three years, uh, <clears throat> we managed to win our battle. But you win a battle, but you don't win a river wars, because they just go on and on and on. There's always this engineering mentality. What, what did they want to do? to the one? Well, it'd be complicated. Basically, uh, it would take me about 20 minutes to oh, explain well, how they're going to do it. I withdraw the question. But uh, they, they, uh, they want to do bad. <laughs> I'll tell okay. you that. But it's a project called Winter Navigation. Uh, the Seaway, built in the 50s, um, only operates eight months a year, of course, because of the ice mm -hmm. conditions and also because of antiquated locks. Uh, but the, the Seaway has not lived up to expectations mm -hmm. promised in the 50s. Yeah. Uh, I have a lot of that in the book Squid Ends in the Ice Age, the whole battle of the early seaways, and ho hopefully I'm going to tell that story someday. That story fascinates me, how the Seaway was pushed in at the zenith of the American Empire, yeah. you know, yeah. as uh, progress's most powerful achievement, and mm -hmm. it's going to save the country and national security. Oh, We're yeah. going to build great warships on the Great Lakes and, excuse me, uh, get them get them out to the Atlantic to do battle with the Russians. And yeah. None of that ever, none ever happened. Yeah. Uh, all the local economies along the St. Lawrence Valley uh, have been gutted. We have the worst unemployment rate in our county of any county in New York State. Mm -hmm. and everything was promised, uh, you know, and the promises were never kept. Mm -hmm. uh, the Seaway never paid for itself. It's only had one year in the black. So to cover up this mistake, uh, they blame it on the fact that they can't get through those four months. In other words, they don't yeah. have year-round shipping. Yeah. So they have to stockpile, they have to lay off workers. So if they get year-round shipping, it'll be okay. It's only gonna cost $3 billion. Uh, <clears throat> you know, and it's the, it's the toehold to getting super tankers in. Because mm -hmm. then they get bigger locks, more channeling, more dredging. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a step towards the total destruction of this area and to much of the areas in the Great Lakes, especially the connecting waters. Mm -hmm. So we realized with this problem early in the game that the solution to our problem lay outside the reach of our organization. Uh, now, a lot of groups independently around the Great Lakes were also finding when they had a problem with acid rain, for example, the solution lay beyond their problems. Yeah. They're finding that pesticides uh, being used in southern uh, agro-businesses, you know, big, big farming uh, co-op corporations, those pesticides enter the jet stream and end up in the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> they're finding, uh, again, uh, that, the, that the solution to the problem lay beyond the reach of their organization or beyond the reach of their issue. 
Yeah. In other words, they're, they're parochially concerned about fishing, mm -hmm. or they're parochially concerned, or regionally concerned, you know, about the safety of the Thousand Islands, or the St. Mary's River, or Mackinac Island, or whatever, if there's mm -hmm. anything left there to save beside the fudge. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, <laughs> in the last 16 months, uh, because of what the changes in the Reagan administration, Roughly 90% of all the research, all the information exchanges that were going on as government agencies have been taken away. So we're caught with this new consciousness that we have to make these connections, <clears throat> and yet we're trapped because the government, through the cutbacks, has taken away the mechanisms. So yeah. uh, it's only natural that the groups start getting together. That's essentially... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what was going on there. You had, of course, a lot of... <clears throat> I loved it. To me, it was probably the best conference that I've attended in my career mm -hmm. because the people real want to win. They win to the extent that they're willing to sit down with a weirdo like me in a <laughs> yeah. certain way, yeah. not realizing, of course, that I'm looking at them. They're just as weird, too, <laughs> yeah. a lot of those people, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, I've uh, overcome... a there are a lot of people that have to overcome prejudices. Mm -hmm. So that movement is exciting because it is a broad-based coalition. The people really do want to win. And uh, I think given that drive, we'll overcome a lot of prejudices and maybe we'll have a chance of uh, saving the Great Lakes. The organization, the headquarters of the organization <coughs> is here in Lansing. Who is it and what is well, it? Well, I, I think the, the spearhead of uh, of the whole movement is the uh, Michigan United uh, Conservation Clubs, MUCC, which is centered here in Lansing, uh, essentially a federation of um, conservation groups, sportsmen, uh, you know, that that kind of thing. But they, they have organizers down there, in particular a guy named Wayne Schmidt, that you can go down and uh, find out beforehand exactly what's going on all over the Great Lakes. They're the best information center right now in this area. Uh, and they are, they, are, they are the ones that brought us all together in a certain sense. I mean, the, the, the media says it was my brainchild, and Wayne's very gracious to say, but like any idea, I'm sure there were thousands and thousands of people <laughs> who said, gee, the, we can't solve the problem of one lake without solving the problem of all lakes. Yeah. So, of course, you know, uh, a lot of people had the idea, and, and MUCC brought it all together, and it'll continue to uh, grow. You feel quite strongly <clears throat> about the conflict between our environment, our ecology, and the economics of, uh, well, of our country, whatever you want to call it. Well, that's... <clears throat> Uh, people in power divide and conquer. That's the way that they, uh, you know, achieve their goal. Through the media, it's done very easily. Uh, it's done because we use a language with a lot of labels, uh, labels that we don't understand necessarily, you know. Uh, but they're just buzzwords so that people will, sit, will hear, up, oh, radical, up. Oh. You know, oh, I'm against drugs. Hey, boom! Ah, but what's a drug? I don't know, 350,000 so drugs. You, no you definitions. Said. Without using definitions, they'll use words because essentially we're not talking about politics or, or philosophy. We're talking about religion in, in, in the U.S. So, of course, you don't need definitions. It's just faith. So we have to overcome a lot of the labels. The label environmentalist is extremely dangerous because the media has taught for years that environmentalists are the ones that stand in the doorway of progress. Yeah. Environmentalists are the softies. They're concerned about birds and fish, but what about the fact that people are unemployed? What about the fact that uh, we have to have a stronger growth rate? What about national security? What about national defense? I mean, what about the hardcore issues that someone like an economist who is really a serious person concerned <laughs> about the hardcore <laughs> issues? I mean, they don't take time out to I look told at you I needed an like economist. Milton Friedman who went around advising Israel which now has 150 percent inflation rate <laughs> right. advises uh, Tiller the Hand Margaret Thatcher over there they have the worst unemployment since 1930 I mean Not to you know the it doesn't uh, matter he's an economist so whether right or wrong he
he's still a very serious person. Environmentalists, <laughs> they're just only operating on their emotions, and we all love yeah. birds and fish, but sure enough, we love the buck better. And they're so, all rich folks, too. Who, oh, uh, yes. Oh, who it pays. Can afford much. to go oh, yeah. out into the yeah, wilderness. Yeah, where yeah, the rest yeah. Of us in fact, can't. every environmentalist, if they want to, if they're talking on campus, they want to increase their fee, they should immediately uh, start billing themselves that, as economists. <laughs> but. <clears throat> You see, there is no difference. The same people that have been screwing up the environment uh, since time immemorial, that same mentality, especially the uh, mentality that was uh, at its zenith in the 50s, those same people that have been screwing up the environment have been screwing up the economy. Mm -hmm. So it's not a question of you're as much an economist as you are an environmentalist. You're as much uh, an environmentalist as you are a, a, an economist. It's just a question if you're a good manager of the resources and the people or you're a bad manager of the resource and the people. Yeah. Whether your strategy is geared towards a very, very few people having very, very fancy clubs in very, very beautiful areas, which they'll always be able to find, mm -hmm. even if trains go out, even if buses go out, even if there is no fuel, because they'll have their own jet planes. And uh, they'll always have tons and tons of money because the economists are working for them. So if you've got economists who are working for the people, if you've got environmentalists who are working for the people, you can save it all. But we've got to guard against that label. I'm an organizer. I am not an environmentalist. I mean, that's plain for yeah. me to see. They don't talk this language, and most of them uh, ain't of the Hebrew persuasion. Uh, Tell us about June 12th. <coughs> well, Barry will go there, actually. <laughs> <laughs> this is my last Abby act for a while. Uh, I am real anxious because uh, I get on I get on the plane from here. In fact, by the time this airs, I'll be out of town, and that's always a good we'll idea. I like tapings. <laughs> I like getting out of town we'll before I shit hit the fan. Plus. But I I will be back, uh, you know, in fine view in the Thousand Islands, uh, working on our our essential issue for the next four months is the transportation of nuclear wastes across the very fragile bridge. Uh, from Canada down to uh, South Carolina. Uh, that's the issue uh, that I feel can mobilize the people in the area, uh, that can let, get a lot of excitement going, and can also affect uh, what's going on all over the country, because this is happening all over the country. Yeah. We're taking back foreign nuclear wastes and dumping them in the U.S. as part of the stupid contract American utility companies make with foreign country so we're taking the shit back and dumping it here and even though no and nobody knows what to do with it and we got a very narrow bridge just a mile from the house and, and you know and we got uh, we got me and now I got the lawyer you know real free I'm real good at getting lawyers for nothing <laughs> and uh, you make them famous that's that, I, I tell you it's half of the trick of organizing figuring out how to get the lawyer for nothing because uh, they're never gonna have much money so yeah yeah, there, there'll, be th there'll be a part of history. Of there'll be a part of history. I like lawyers because lawyers want to win. They know about win. They go in there and there's, a, there's another son of a bitch across the way. They're yelling at them and they got to beat that son of a bitch. Yeah. They beat that son of a bitch and their client goes free. That's innocent. That's called win. They're guilty. That's a loss. <laughs> the, the, many organizers, many people on the left, many activists don't understand winning and losing. They get lost in the, in the message so to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not, they have no way of measuring. Lawyers do. That's why so many are politicians. So uh, I well, like... Lawyers are dealing with an, an immediate uh, issue and it, it's a tangible issue yeah. too. Yeah. Well, I uh, like to concretize it that way too. I have to in my mm -hmm. mind. Yeah, it can't right. be too big a goal. I don't work for the elimination of world hunger, frankly. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a real, real bummer. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. I have to have something that sets in mind. Even though the vision is big, you know, the, mm -hmm. the goals have to be somewhat within your grasp. Right, right. Uh, or else you're going to bum yourself out. You're going to get disillusioned and everybody along with you is well, going to get bummed uh, out. On so, that point, Abby, earlier you were talking about people realizing that uh, if they're trying to clean up the river or <clears throat> yeah. do something about uh, pesticides coming from the south and affecting them, so it's it's a problem that can't be solved in that area. It yeah. can't have to be solved. Well, maybe <clears throat> that's where politics come into play, and that's where look. That's where you got to start looking at areas outside and global. And that's to get back to the question. That's why I'll be down in front of the UN on June 12th, protesting uh, the nuclear arms buildup. 
because, uh, you know, uh, nuclear war is going to screw up <laughs> all the plans that we have in the Thousand Islands, all the plans to fight uh, against winter navigation, all the plans to get together to save the Great Lakes and everything, and it's going to frankly screw up everybody's career plans, all the big hopes you have for public access TV as an alternative. <laughs> so I think the nuclear arms race is the burning issue of the 80s. It is the thing that is going to unite everybody. And it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a great issue because it's very easy to demonstrate to the average American that building these Dr. Strangelove big weapons does not in fact help our national security. To the contrary, it only contributes more to our national insecurity. Yeah. Right. So, uh, <clears throat> and, and it's, where, see, where the exciting part about this rally, which we hope to be the largest in U.S. history, we're expecting uh, minimum half a million people on June 12th. Well, Many I coming from all over the world. Half a million down in Washington in 1969. 69 half a million. We had three quarters of a million in 1967 outside uh, the UN, um, spring 1967. I, you know, I could, as national organizer, you know, you know how to do 10, 000, New York City, it's 10,000 people per city block. You just count the city blocks. And, <laughs> you know, you, you, know you, you take the police estimate yeah. and multiply it by. Uh, you know, you double that, <laughs> you, yeah. you, uh, and they take your you half the estimate of the revolutionary worker communist party paper that's on the communist. There's a formula where you can yeah. put it together and actually come within one percentage point <laughs> of how many people are actually there. <laughs> you know, but that's... Uh, but that's really exciting. If you, if you we have a shot at a million people. people. Yeah. There, there are 25,000 alone that we know that are coming from Japan which is, uh, you know, of course, very conscious of the effects yeah, of nuclear yeah. war and a uh, very good teacher. Do you think this, this movement uh, is getting through to Reagan at all? He, he oh, yeah. N Reagan, of course, he already... He talks about the freeze. He's for a yeah. freeze. The problem is he's for the build-up and then the then freeze, the freeze yeah. you know? Yeah. I think he should go for the war and then the freeze. It'd be quicker and quieter <laughs> and a lot cheaper, but uh, <clears throat> we're caught... I like the language of the freeze, the word freeze, mm -hmm. actually better than a halt. Yeah. Because yeah. the average American is has been taught for too many years that you know all you got to say is the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming. They'll run to the bank, take out all their hard-earned money, <laughs> send it in taxes down to Washington, build <laughs> us a bigger bomb. I mean, it's 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 uh, like I say, it's religious voodoo. Yeah, it is. Uh, scaring because the devil's coming, the mm -hmm. Russians are coming, and uh, no, it's 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 scary. Uh, I'm, I'm for the freeze. It doesn't interfere with my politics because I believe that the U.S. is ahead in the nuclear arms race. I believe the Polaris submarines are indefensible, so mm -hmm. therefore we have the edge. Yeah. We have the largest no we have a larger number of warheads than the Russians, mm -hmm. even by CIA estimates. Mm -hmm. The missile gap got started in the 60s. That was uh, Kennedy's, Kennedy's idea. Yeah. It was a trick to win the debate. And mm -hmm. then Nixon caught up and said, we're even further behind than <laughs> Kennedy says. And <laughs> from then on, all the politicians that wanted to make some hay, some hysterical hay, kept saying, we're behind. Mm -hmm. Now, as long as you have the military industrial complex keeping score, you always have to be behind. Sure. Because you can't catch up unless you're behind. Unless you're Avis, you know, how can you chase Hertz? Yeah. So you need more money. That's mm -hmm. how you get the money to catch up. I yeah. mean, as, yeah. as soon as a country says they're ahead, the people are going to say, well, now we can spend money on something else. Mm -hmm. So as long as the military industrial complex is keeping score, I think, in fact, there's no way of measuring it. But mm -hmm. er anybody's got to look at the Russian economy and say that they've got their problems too. They don't want this arms race any more than we do, you know, so they've got their